I'm Ron Mataya. Hey, Dan. <laughs> Ron Mataya. I, um, I teach at Loma Linda University in the School of Public Health, and I lead the Global Health uh, Program at Loma Linda University. Um, um, and um, my home country uh, is Malawi, and uh, so anything to do with Malawi uh, is always uh, very thrilling for me. And I've been privileged to be able to continue working with, uh, in Malawi. We, um, I, 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 I've been privileged to have two, two academic appointments, uh, my main one being with Loma Linda University and the second one being with Baylor College of Medicine, where we are supporting the training of uh, OBGYNs, nurse midwives in Malawi. So I spend five months of the year in Malawi and the rest of the year at, uh, at uh, Loma Linda University. In fact, I just got back from Malawi last week uh, for the exams. <clears throat> But uh, it's a privilege to be able to, uh, to um, moderate this session. Um, it's kind of frightening when you have uh, ladies uh, up front. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, kind of intimidating. Uh, but no, 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 it's not intimidating. It's very friendly, very Christian, very, very Christian, very, very Christian. <laughs> no antagonism here. Uh, so, uh, but many factors uh, affect the quality of a health system and its ability to respond to natural disasters, uh, outbreaks, and conflict, and meet the primary health care needs of a population. Uh, this panel, uh, this august panel here, will share the following initiatives to strengthen health systems through data, assessment, collaboration, and capacity building. So I'm not going to read through the three um, paragraphs here. Please go through those. And I'm also not going to, in, in the, in the uh, um, uh, uh, cog uh, in cognizance of time, I'm not going to read through the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, bios of our, our uh, presenters here, but uh, if you can go to the back page, you will find the information about each one of, of, of them. And so without uh, um, um, much more than what I've said, I will ask uh, Barbara to uh, come to the front and present on the importance of collaboration in health systems. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mataya, and um, thank you all for being here. I'm really excited to be here today and share. This topic is absolutely vital to everything we do and a huge passion of mine, the importance of working together and collaboration. Um, Real briefly, I just want to share a little bit about the Dalton Foundation and the background. We've been working with health system strengthening projects since 1998 around the world. Uh, recently, we took a new turn kind of in strategy of how, how we give and, and how we can, we have a phrase, we always say, how do we make one plus one equal more than two? And um, what I'm kind of going to go through today is kind of our philosophy behind that and how we our passion is really to bring healthcare providers together and create ways to make one plus one equal more than two and to make programs that are effective and sustainable delivering high quality of care. So that's our overall goal and what we do. Um, today, um, and this explains it a little bit more about that, you know, we truly believe that in order to make changes in a system you have to really understand what's already going on you have to know who's doing what where and to what capacity and so whenever we enter a new project a new nation or a new program we always do this in some form or fashion and i'll explain a little bit today about what we're doing in haiti with that and then what that allows you to do after you create connection with technology connection with people you're able to implement a lot more programs, a lot more efficiently, a lot more effectively, and we believe a lot more sustainably. So that's a little bit about our philosophy. Um, here it is outlined a little bit more detail about what we've done, and I'm gonna explain specifically what we've done in the nation of Haiti in the past few years. Um, we have uh, access to a technology tool that we've kind of morphed into what we call Relink Global Health. And this is an online search tool. And we've done um, mapping in Haiti. So we've, again, we have always do collaboration. So collaborating with the Ministry of Health to get their data that they already have. And then using our Haitian staff, which I'm thrilled to have Mr. Kofsky with us here today, who does, leads all the work on the ground in Haiti for us, which is a huge blessing. And he goes around and gets, using the WHO guidelines, gathering a lot more detailed capacity data. 
And that work's been going on in various forms for over two years now, and is, I'll explain a little bit more about that in a minute as where we are in that. Our second step is to create connectivity in much the way that CCIH does here, and we want to bring healthcare professionals together in a professional environment where they can not only meet each other, which we think is really valuable, they can share ideas, share best practices, and we do believe there's a huge power in the community, as I think everyone here knows. So we've done that in Haiti. Uh, we looked at networks that already existed in different parts of the country. With uh, There's the Cap Haitian Health Network that already existed, so how do we tap into what they're already doing, strengthen it, expand it? We found some different networks in other parts of the country, and we're doing the same thing there to connect those networks to create a stronger community. So that's been going on um, in Haiti. We hold conferences much like this throughout the nation uh, to bring Haitian healthcare professionals together and give them a voice to speak share ideas, concerns, problems, and most importantly, solutions. And then in step three, once you have all those together, then you take the people, the leaders you've met, the strong leaders, you have the data of where everything is, and you have the voice of the people that have spoken, which is very important, and you design some projects or programs that you can now run through um, this system. So it's a little bit of our philosophy behind that. Um, this is really in global health, what it currently looks like now uh, for the country of Haiti. This is set up to be used in any country and morphed for different uses. Um, and so this, what this is, is basically trying a little bit to answer the question of how do you use data? You know, we gather data, um, and then the question is how do you analyze it and how do you use it? We don't totally have all those things answered yet. But what we've done is we've taken part of the data, not everything we're gathering, and we make it available to the public. So I've got the English version up there, but it's also in French and Creole for the people of Haiti to have access to be able to find different kinds of services. And we have everything in there, obviously, from basic medical services, services for the blind, services for the deaf, um, prosthetic services. We kind of try to think of everything and then everything you'd also need in a supply chain, medical supplies, um, medical equipment is a big one. Where are the ultrasound machines throughout the country? Where are the x-ray machines? So giving this data to the people, um, and we hope and think is an easy way to use it. And again, we use this software. This is Haiti, but it is adaptable to any other country, and it's already set up to do that. Um, there's a little bit about the Haiti Health Network and the why behind why we did that. We really are passionate about the importance of the local people, and we want to use this as a way to give a voice uh, to the Haitian people to hear their biggest concerns and struggles to understand what's really going on and then to be able, as a donor, as a provider, be able to come in at the appropriate time, at the appropriate place to deliver the programs and the funds in the most effective way. Um, so that's, that's our goal with that. And then our goal, we started with conferences in the bigger cities, Port-au-Prince, Cap Haitian, and now we're in the process of moving out more into the rural areas to, to bring the conferences to the people who can't always get into the bigger cities. And then I just highlighted a few projects that we're in various phases of working on in Haiti with various partners. We are not um, going to do all these projects ourselves, but again, through the relationships, through the partnerships, bringing people together, and then having this network as a background to where people can then run the program or their idea through the system. So these are just a few examples of that we're working on with medical equipment. We're also working medications, all the typical supply chain stuff, medical records, uh, emergency response, all these things in a health system that are really important and our goal is to strengthen them. The one program I'm gonna highlight today um, is a medical equipment management program that we're working on um, kind of heavily right now, so which is why I did it. Um, we, uh, obviously gathering data, everyone who does it knows there's a lot of detail involved. Um, Mr. Kofsky has done a immaculate job in the northern part of Haiti with his team, and the Northeast data in particular is, we believe, at like the 100% complete mark right now and unbelievably accurate. And what we've found, and that this isn't revolutionary information, but you've got health systems uh, way out in the front lines, and, and, we, and we think of the whole health system. So you've got way people on the front lines um, that are delivering health care. You've got your middle level facilities, and then you've got your hospitals. And so, again, we know the different players at these facilities. 
how do we then take this information and we want to strengthen their health system, how do we take them all to the next level? So how do we most help the provider on the front lines, then the clinics in the middle, and then how do you work on the hospitals? So when, when we talk about medical equipment, um, what we're thinking about doing, what we're planning on doing in this area is, is one thing we noticed is that even the basics on the front line regarding equipment are not always available. Sometimes a stethoscope might be the only diagnostic tool a provider has. Um, how do we then, we have, we have a kit designed of what we're going to use to distribute to the partners in the program uh, that have the basics for diagnostics in it to help them do their jobs that they've been trained to do better. So having the blood pressure cuff and monitor, having everything that works, even just thermometers, blood pressure, excuse me, blood glucose monitors, uh, urinalysis, um, things like that, just nebulizers is another one I forgot, but just basics and make those provided to those people in that department on the front lines. Um, and we have, a, we have an M&E program in place as well of what we're going to ask before the program starts and then also evaluate after so we can understand, does this impact patient care? Is this imp increasing access to care? Is it allowing more patients to be treated in a more effective way? So strategically designing those questions um, before we do that first distribution this fall and then being able to follow up with all those partners later. So that's our plan at the, at the lower level. And then in the middle level, um, we will take those clinics that are, do have some basic equipment, but then how do we strategically with their staffing and who they have, what is the most, what pieces of equipment would be the most impactful to help take them to the next level? We have several biomeds on staff that are going to be meeting with the people at the appropriate facilities to make sure all that happens and each facility is outlined what they will receive. And then the last step is the larger, the referral hospitals, again, which we probably know these are the best just because of the relationships, but what can we do to them to help them be able to respond to the, the more critical needs that they're seeing in their department? Um, so yeah, I just, sorry, I got behind on my slides. I just talked and talked and talked, I'm sorry. <laughs> This is just a highlight and overview um, of things that we uh, that I basically just talked about through all the things of all, all our partners. Um, and that, that highlights the things. This, this I didn't touch on everything. We, we've thought through everything. We've had so much input on this, which I'm really thankful for from everybody with uh, people that have done the work in Haiti already. There's been biomeds trained. There's been all things done, and we've kind of gotten all of them in a room to learn what's worked, what hasn't worked, what do they think about the systematic approach, and, and it's been really eye-opening for us, but it's also been really, I think, to the point where now we have a good plan that is including everything from, how do we get everything from the U.S. into Haiti, how is it effectively distributed, how is it installed properly and efficiently, how is it used, yeah, how is clinical training provided, and also a repair plan, because if any of you work with equipment, and developing nation, you know that it will break and getting it repaired is a challenge. So keeping spare parts in country, working on standardizing equipment, which we acknowledge will be very difficult, but when we provide certain things through this program, they will all be the same make, the same model, so that they'll be in the department at that level um, with support. So that we, the, the goal is to increase the number of patient days where it's working. Because uh, you know the challenge is all the time things are down, they're not only down for a few days like they might be here, they're down for weeks, they're down for months, they may be down forever. So the goal, and that is the definitely measurable outcome we'll be looking for, is how many service days can we increase um, devices by. So I didn't want to take up too much time because I know there's so many people to share, but my purpose of sharing that medical equipment program was Again, in our mind, we have so many other things we can run through that network, even at the same time with the partners that have been together. We can easily, and we're, and we're going to at various levels, run through medication distribution, especially for you know, the non-communicable diseases, having that be part of this program as well. We can look at a lot of different challenges and kind of run them through simultaneously, and we're gonna do that testing over the next couple years. So, I will be available afterwards for any questions. I know if any of you want to talk to Kofsky too, he is on the front lines and very informative of all the collaboration and work that he's done in the region for a long time that really this wouldn't you know, be possible without that on the ground leadership that we're so thankful for. So thank you and look forward to talking with y'all.
And I'm taking off my CCIH Chairman of the Board hat and putting on my AmeriCares hat for you all. Um, and I'm going to talk about, there we go, is it up? Is it up? It's not up. Perfect. So um, talking about embedding care into health system strengthening. I will tell you in my long career I came late to health system strengthening and partly because I'm a very results oriented person. Can we measure whether we need a difference or not? And the vertical programs are awesome. You know, you do immunization, you can measure the change. You do a dedicated AIDS program, you can measure services delivered. But I was involved in the beginning of Global Fund and PEPFAR, and one of the things we learned is if you have lots of resources dedicated to a narrow area, there are hydraulics that happen. People, resources move from the broad system and go into the narrow system. And we can't measure what happened in maternal and child health and other areas because of the huge focus on AIDS, TB, and malaria. But we know they got hurt and they got neglected. And so I began to really be a believer in health system strengthening and a, a strong health system. And then the question is, how do you know that you're working? How do you get results and begin to measure um, the difference that you can make in health system strengthening? We've got some um, really good evidence out there that is being built. Um, the National Academy of Sciences did a, um, a review a few years ago. So when I came to AmeriCares, which is a secular organization, I wanted to make sure that in the pieces of programming that we chose to do that we retained the idea of a strong health system, that we built that platform that Mona was talking about this morning on which everything else should be built. And we have been trying to figure out how to do it and to measure it. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about one of our major initiatives, but with a, a lens of how do you get care into your health system strengthening programs? And I wanted to say in the last session, um, Peter talked about trust as the software. I'm going to posit that actual care is what leads to trust, which is the software in the health system strengthening. And if ever there was a place for the faith-based organizations to live out caring to build trust. I think that's something that CCIH um, should focus on. We're a secular organization and it's still a priority for us and so that's what I'm gonna talk about today. So um, my boss, this is his favorite one-liner in, he says it every time he does a pre uh, presentation for our organization. Um, we have a strategy that is focused on the local um, health system, the local health partners at a primary care level. It is not the whole health system, but it's the piece of the broad health system that fits with who we are as an organization, our history and our future. So we believe that when the local health centers thrive, the communities and the people thrive, and that they will not only be healthier, that they will have greater opportunity and more productive lives. Pretty um, straightforward. We have had for um, more than 20 years now, a, um, a essentially a polyclinic, a secondary level um, uh, system in El Salvador. And they have always talked about one of the most important components of the work they do is warmth. They hire people based on that. They make sure their service delivery is based on that. And it is the go-to place for the people in rural El Salvador. And the organization began to realize just how powerful that care and warmth is in promoting better health. So as we began to look at that primary care level system and how it fits within a larger health system and how do we measure whether um, we are improving the health system, diverting the health system, there are gaping holes in the health system that are hindering our ability to serve people. We came up with what we call the strive to thrive. It isn't a stamp of approval, you've reached the five star level. It's working with partners to say wherever you are now, 
Let us help you along the journey to being stronger. And we look at the center itself and begin to measure the health service provision. We use the WHO building blocks. I'll talk about that a little bit and measure the functioning of the health system. But really important is it's not isolated. What is the connection to the larger health system? That's easy if you're part of a public health system and you have an automatic connection, but the faith-based organizations use often struggle with being included in the health system, getting money from the health system, getting your data reported by the health system. We need everyone that is providing health services in an intact health system to have that bi-directional communication to the larger health system. Equivalently, uh, we talk often about um, patient care. I see that also as a bi-directional relationship the clinic should be reaching out and caring for the patients. We often measure that in you know, patient satisfaction and exit interviews, but the patients also should be looking at how do they reach into and have a voice into the healthcare system that is taking care of them. Similarly, we've heard a lot of examples of, about trust, where trust has not existed. Um, it hinders communities' access to the healthcare system. So as we look at a thriving local health center, we want to look at, is the clinic reaching out into the community? Are they pro um, promoting the prevention services that was asked about in the last ses in session as well? And not only do they trust the community and can you measure that, but do they have a voice in it? Is there, there is a best practice that communities should have some kind of voice into the governance around those health systems. That's an actionable item that we can do something about. So we took this, what I call our four C's. It starts with just the health facility and WHO building blocks, and then it's all about relationships coming out from that health facility in order to have it thrive better. We began this in, in 2018 and developed what we thought was going to be a rapid assessment tool. Wow, it's really hard to measure all of those components and even a very superficial analysis of all six building blocks quickly. So it was too unwieldy at first. It's stripped down now. It's faster. Is it perfect? No, no not by any means. Um, but we have, a, oh, we have a tool and we started working on it. Um, we began both in um, internationally in Haiti, in India, in Philippines, in the U.S., and we have U.S. equivalents as well, which has been very interesting because they also need help to thrive and work well. Um, and it's gone very rapidly. We now have 22 sites in nine different countries, and the key piece is to do the rapid assessment find out where what's functioning well and where there are gaps. And then in conversation with the partners that are actually implementing, and many of the places where we work, we're working with the Ministry of Health in Malawi. And in Haiti, we're working with faith-based partners in other countries um, and uh, some of our own sites. So it's a whole mix. We've got public, we've got private, we've got big, we've got small, we've got a hospital in Tanzania, we've got very rural centers in Nepal and Philippines, which Joan will talk about. Um, and we're looking at how then can we identify the gaps, do the conversation with the, on those identified gaps, what are the biggest things that that manager thinks will be transformative and within our areas of expertise begin to meet those gaps and then see by a, a repeat assessment over a period of time, is it getting better? I'll tell you our first sites, which are in the US, are about to graduate and there the metric will be, do they get the NCQA, the National Center for Quality Assurance certification of a patient-centered medical home? So. Uh, it's both a health systems, it's both got data, but it's all about how do we move it so that it's thriving and caring for the people it serves. So as you can see here, the, the six building blocks, 
in the connection to the health systems, we're looking at the referral pathways. Are they vibrant? Are they robust? Does anybody know where they are or how to use them? Um, do they get down from the health system, the policies, the procedures? Are they dust covered or are they active and used? Um, again, the community trust and oversight. And I just want to highlight on the care part around the patients. It isn't just whether the patient feels cared for, but also whether the healthcare worker thinks they are caring for the patient and values that. And one of the most interesting things that I'm finding as we do our initial review of the data is the disconnects because we get data points from the administrators of the health systems, from the healthcare workers within the health system, from key informants in the um, community and the patients. And you ask the same question and somebody says, oh yeah, we've got all the services that the, our community needs. And you go to the community and they say, I can't get in ever. Or not, you know, the healthcare workers say, I treat our patients well. And we know that respectful care is a really huge um, global policy agenda right now. But you go and talk to the patients and they say, I get disrespected all the time. They never listen to me. They don't hear me. They don't tell me what's going on in my life. And so we found some of our most useful conversations about gaps that need to be addressed are in the disconnects between what gets reported to us by the different players. So it's been fascinating. And at the you know, the data level, it's lovely for identifying a programmatic area, but these disconnects are engendering incredible conversations that are changing the approach. So we just did this in the Dominican Republic, and at the end of the, um, the assessment, we had expected them to ask us to do supply chain and get them more medicines and maybe some clinical training. We're working with four institutions in this case, um, a nursing home, two clinic sites, and an, um, a community center for uh, street kids. And to a T, they all ask to have training for their staff, their providers, in how to treat their patients or their colleagues respectfully. Who would have thought? And it came out of the assessment tool and the um, the the discord in the in the data. So these are the kinds of things we measure. It's not perfect. We continue to refine it. And um, so those are the kinds of things we're looking at. Some of the questions that we ask that specifically relate to care within this tool, we ask the, the healthcare workers, do you understand patients' rights and their expectations for respectful care? Do you agree that your colleagues are um, providing that clear instruction. We ask whether the healthcare workers themselves feel cared for. Um, and that, again, we ask at the administration, what kinds of um, policies and procedures do you have to ensure the safety of the healthcare workers? Because we have a completely separate program on health worker safety. And one of the things we found is that when healthcare workers feel cared for, they stay longer, they serve their patients better. So it's caring for patients and it's caring for the healthcare workers. Um, same kinds of questions, some of them you know, pretty standard and we've drawn from national standards as much as we can for both the community feeling cared for, trust in the community, hopefully both standardized and replicable enough so that over time and in repeat administrations, we can see whether we're making a difference, but also tailored to the specifics of how you would address it in those uh, specific settings. This is what our tool looks like, and you can see this is only half of it, um, but that we track what the facility managers say, what the healthcare workers say, what the clients say, we gather qualitative information as well as observations. Not only did they say this, but do, is that what we saw? They say they got medicine. Is there really any on the shelf kind of thing? Um, and then in the discussion between both our, our survey or our headquarters staff or our field staff and whoever is managing that, we talk about 
Is this basically red, yellow, or green? Very qualitative. Are we mostly okay with the services that are provided or is this a gaping hole? And that is a qualitative measure. And it leads to where we go on the next slide, which captures some of the same data. And well, I guess this is the second half. We do a second one that then says, okay, of the things that are yellow or red, maybe it's inventory management or maybe like the Dominican Republic example, it's respectful care, which of those areas that have been identified as gaps will they prioritize as a place where they would like to have some programmatic training and intervention? And then that's where we go. We often find, since we're one of the few organizations that do infrastructure, which is part of health system strengthening, the first thing they want is something about their infrastructure cleaned up, which is lovely because it's visible. And then we move into the much more programmatic areas as we, as an organization, also build trust with our partners on the ground. So it's been a really, really exciting endeavor. It's um, growing very rapidly because it's capturing the attention of you know, our organization, certainly, but also of donors and of the places we work. So as we're talking about um, what people would like us to be doing with them, this is something that is really resonating and they've asked for this kind of intervention. What else does AmeriCares do? And this is going to lead into Joan's um, presentation a little bit. And um, we're looking at where can we embed care even more broadly. As I mentioned earlier, we have a health worker safety program that we've been working on um, in India, in Tanzania, in, in other countries. It um, crosses from getting them um, vaccination for hepatitis B so that they are safe and um, their own environment to um, health worker safety, IPC kinds of interventions. Are there lights? Is there somebody to call on if they're in danger? So a whole thing around keeping the healthcare workers safe. We have a um, growing, rapidly growing program in mental health psychosocial that is looking at um, direct service provision in some places, post-disaster mental health psychosocial work, as well as integrating mental health components into patient care in Syrian refugees in Jordan, into Puerto Rico resiliency for healthcare workers so that they can themselves, our uh, victims, can um, be strong in their own experiences, but also recognize and be strong in what they do for others and in our emergency programs. So we're just now doing um, a big scale up along the Colombia-Venezuela border, doing direct service provision in primary care sites. And in every place, we have a doctor, two nurses, the administrative person, and a psychologist embedded in every single one of those teams. So all of the people who appear to have any, you know, their screen for any kind of emotional health or coping and resiliency, gender-based violence, and all pregnant women go to see the psychologist. So we're a secular organization with a lot of Christians within the organization, and we are trying to embed caring into every piece of what we're doing. And so I'll just leave you with that notion that whether your organization is faith-based or secular or even government, we can in fact embed caring into health systems and it will make a difference for our patients and population. Thank you. So John, John will be presenting on mental health and psychosocial support. As you can see, the, uh, the different uh, presenters each has a, a, a specialized area of work, but that all those areas combine to provide a holistic approach to Christian healthcare in our institutions. And so we will have you present on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. And it's always fun when your boss tees you up really well. So thank you, Anne. Appreciate it. For this session, we're gonna talk about a mental health and psychosocial support capacity building program in the Philippines. And if by the end of this session, each and every one of you within your organizations thinks, my gosh, that was not rocket science and we can do that, I'll consider it to be a great success. So that'll be my indicator, because it is terribly doable. But often at AmeriCares, we get started on these kinds of programs using an emergency response as our 
entree into that domain. And it worked beautifully with our response in the Philippines because it all started with the super typhoon, not just a typhoon, super typhoon Haiyan in November of 2013. And it cut a swath across the central part of the Philippines and left just untold devastation across the entire Visayas region. Entire towns were leveled. 90% um, of the buildings in, in Tacloban, which is near where MacArthur landed in World War II, for those of you, um, you know, kind of sprucing up on your World War II history this month, uh, where he landed and returned, um, leaving more than 6,000 people dead, more, almost 2 million people homeless, and more than 6, mil 6 million people displaced. And if you can imagine just living through that experience, the winds were over 196 miles an hour. And for those of you in kilometers, that's 315 kilometers an hour. It howls, it just, you know, debris is falling on you while it's happening. It's frightening and terrifying and leaves a lot of devastation. So we had a lot of families who were left with loss, um, which led to grief, people left with tra traumatic dis traumatic stress, um, fearful, and for those who lost their homes, lost their jobs, were injured and needed to recover for a long time, a tremendous amount of uncertainty. I don't do well with uncertainty. Every time I need to change a job or move house or move my kids into a new school, I get a little anxious and edgy and kind of cranky at home. And I can't imagine what these families were going through, trying to just put one foot in front of another and live day to day. But then we have the ongoing prevalence of issues, challenges, mental health and psychosocial needs that the community experiences on an ongoing basis. So it's not just disaster and conflict that present the need for mental health and psychosocial support, but it's just life and it's who we are, it's who we are biologically and who we are in terms of relationships and dynamics. So the WHO estimates that about 14% of the global burden of disease is represented by neuropsychiatric disorders. It's 14%, it's a lot. And they're probably undermining the success of treatment and a lot of the other diseases that represent the global burden of disease. The, per the prevalence in the Philippines is about the same in terms of the neuropsychiatric disorders, but schizophrenia in the Philippines seems to be a bit more prevalent. And we know that there's a familial tendency with schizophrenia and they're trying to do a good job of identifying and treating people because of the effect it has not only on the individual, but their nuclear family in their home and even the neighbors around them. And suicide is a huge problem globally and in the Philippines with a lot of depression underlying that. And so what to do? We knew that most of the facilities and services in the, in the Philippines were at tertiary level, which tended to be more like warehousing. Psychiatric hospitals are not the friendliest space. They're not terribly caring. Um, some individuals express that they would never put their sister in a facility like that because she'll be raped. And instead, if someone has a psychotic issue and isn't able to be verbal anymore, especially with a lot of our young men uh, around age of 20, having their schizophrenia manifest and they're acting out and the family doesn't know what to do but they don't want to warehouse them 300 kilometers away, end up putting them in a small room on the side of the house. And at, over the next several years, which can add up to about 20 years, that person ends up living just a tremendously horrible existence, often naked, having food just kind of shoved under a, a gate, um, becoming nonverbal, and it's not a nice experience for anyone. So we wanted to create capacity, not just for those experienced post-traumatic stress from a storm, but to make sure that the entire spectrum of need was being addressed, and not at tertiary level, but at primary healthcare level. And so we set out to build capacity and decided with the government 
um, of the Philippines to focus on northern Cebu. That's northern Cebu up there in the red circle. There are about 14 municipalities up there who agreed to work with us on planning for training of their staff and their community leadership. We started off with taking an inventory of what resources in terms of trainers and policies and guidelines were already available at the regional office and with the provincial teams and made sure that we accessed the, those talents and those resources to get started with our capacity building. And we want to make sure that there was space in each of the rural health units for counseling and assessment and support groups to meet. We bought lots of chairs for people to sit on I mean, who would know that a white plastic patio chair, if you buy 30 of those for the rural health unit, they love you forever. And it just made such a difference for them to be able to, to manage their intervention as they got started because they had space that they could declare was special for this purpose. And they took advantage of it. And to this day, those spaces are protected. And then providing them with some signage and banners. And for anyone of our Philippines experience here, signage and banners are important culturally in this context um, because it declares that an initiative is important to the team and important to the community. And it um, generates a lot of engagement with the initiative. We started off training using WHO's MHGAP curriculum and their guidelines because it's already done, it's vetted, it's solid. And it was a way to get the more senior members of the rural health unit teams trained on assessment, diagnosis, and prescribing, which is the more medical end of what we wanted to do. Then we trained nurses and midwives in the softer stuff, all the communication techniques that they need to help create resilience, help do the problem solving that doesn't require medication, art therapy, which is a love of our team, I have to tell you, um, counseling and organizing and managing support groups. And the, this space was pre having um, space dedicated to this purpose, but it didn't matter to them. They'd squash themselves into any space that was available in that health unit in order to make the support groups happen. Baranga health workers are the equivalent of a community health worker, and they have been trained and capacitated tremendously to the point where they're able to identify a family who might have a family member in distress who might need some assessment and treatment. They've, they're able to give education sessions to the community so the community knows what to be looking for and knows what kind of help can happen. Like, what are the, what's the success for that patient going to be if they refer them to the rural health unit for care? And is there going to be a successful outcome? And they're helping to create some resilience and coping skills amongst the community so that each person can be a really good friend, a good sister, a good listener, and um, obviate the need to enter into, health, into the health system at all. Psychological first aid is next on the list for this level to be trained in. And we know that because the Philippines gets hit with about four major typhoons a year and is on the ring of fire for earthquakes, um, that having that psychological first aid available at community level is going to be an asset as we move forward. So all of this was to create a continuum of care that was negotiated with the Department of Health, including the referral levels, to make sure that we were fitting into a system and not creating a parallel system. And so we've established the community level capacity by training the Barangay health workers to both identify and to do community-based interventions. The midwives at the Barangay health stations, which are like a health post, are capacitated as well to do some interventions on their own and refer for other needs. They also advocate with the local leadership to make sure that this service is appreciated by the, um, the the equivalent of the local elected leaders, like a ward counselor, making sure that financial resources, space, um, fitting into the agendas of festivals and health days, et cetera, that all of that's appreciated. At the rural health unit, the public health nurses are 
very well trained in triaging if someone is more psychotic and needs medical help or identifying needs that can be met simply through counseling and ongoing support. They also manage the support groups. And then of course the medical officers are trained to diagnose and provide initial treatment. All of this is supported through supervision and support from psychiatrists who visit to do problem solving, make sure that the diagnosis is quite on track and as medications perhaps aren't working any longer, or if there's a, a more significant issue with a client, they can help the medical officer to get the patient back on track. The regional hospital is also there for more severe outpatient needs and some short-term inpatient if necessary. And then the last ditch uh, level of care is the tertiary psychiatric hospital, but we're doing everything we can to make sure that that is not needed uh, wherever possible. It's not where we want anyone to go. So how's the community responding? Is this working? Is it accepted? We know that in many countries, local leadership is not that excited to have these programs take up budget space and a time and attention from their teams because the machismo takes over. It's like, well, we don't have those problems. Well, through the community outreach that our teams have done, if you look at the angle of that graph, <laughs> it's pretty dramatic. The um, visits for mm -hmm. psychotic episodes has increased tenfold up to about where it should be for the um, prevalence and the size of these um, catchment areas for the rural health units. It's not an increase in prevalence. Mm -hmm. It's finally an increase in response by the community for using the services that have now been put into place and made available and understood by the community. The community, this is where Anne will appreciate it, the community is even coming for talk therapy. You know, when people are stressed, um, they're, they're going to help have someone help them sort through what's going on in their lives and reduce their anxiety and distress. This is something that's not been culturally a part of Filipino life, and we're just thrilled that in northern Cebu it's becoming a thing that people do. Local leadership is finally budgeting for medications and supplies that we support initially, but they're putting them in their line budgets for the next um, budget years. And they're ensuring that the staff is made available for training, that the staff is made available for providing services. Not all of them are all that great. We have some mayors who prefer to build a bridge or give his brother-in-law a contract, and they don't really care about budgeting for these things. But as the um, air, entire area is having more and more experience with the services being successful and having a nexus of family members have a much more positive experience with life. Most of the mayors and councilmen are realizing that this is a valuable service for their communities and they're buying in. When you think about it, almost everyone has a family or friend, family member or friend who is touched by a need and so they're they're catching on. I asked the team what makes it work. Well, they said that that community education, what they call psychoeducation, helping the community un to understand what the mental health issues as an entire range of issues can be and what they might look like and what services are available to help each, um, each issue along that spectrum, what's available, and that the support groups are there to make sure that People have a peer group, they have connectedness, they have relationship, they have some positive reinforcement for engaging in their care has been a huge part of the success where it is successful. Regular patient follow-up has ensured that when patients are experiencing tremendous side effects or not understanding how their medications are helping them, the doctor is able to problem solve with them and keep them connected. I was asked yesterday um, by one of our, our members here if we've seen a lot of, seen um, uh, people relapsing and stopping their medications and deciding that taking a daily medication chronically is just too tedious and not for them or that they just feel so much better they don't need it anymore. And we don't have long enough experience with this, but it's something that we're gonna to have to be watching for to make sure that the tedium of a daily medication isn't undermining um, compliance. 
And advocacy with local leadership I mentioned has been tremendous. I want to add one of my own um, factors of success. And when you see this patient in the middle here, she she's schizophrenic and she was recovered from one of these family environments where she was non-functional. She's now um, verbal and working selling candles on the street to earn a little bit of income. And when you look at her smile and how she's looking at this young resident, um, you can see how much affection there is between the patient and this provider. It's providers like this young man who just as a young, a young doc who is just saying, we can do this. You know, it's, it's important. We, we can care and it's possible to actually deliver this service and creating that relationship that is so key to the success of the program. And so the other factor is celebrating success. The team always honors the rural health units that have embraced the program, engaged with it, came to own it and moved it forward. And uh, they have an annual award ceremony um, that you can see is taken very seriously by the team. Um, and it, it helps to generate a lot of ownership and engagement and um, excitement about the program. So the program is not perfect. It has, the training has evolved over time in, in a rather patchwork fashion. And now the team is able to look back and reflect on what's made it work, what has resonated the best with the healthcare workers and with the community. And they're packaging it and codifying it and, and organizing the whole process now as we go into new communities and work with new teams, how to compress that into a very efficient package and, and move it forward. Is this not super easy and super doable? I just, just think about it. It's super easy, super doable, and people love it. The community feels so cared for. Um, oh, I, I need to add one factor if I can. Um, there's, there's talk therapy, there's re resilience and coping. The team decided that on mental health days to help people understand what feeling good feels like, they started adding music and dance. In Southern Africa, that's pretty much standard in communities that you're gonna have an opportunity to get that adrenaline rush from um, music and dance and to feel really good. But in this part of the Philippines, they weren't doing that in their communities very much. So now they've added Zumba. <laughs> And they love it. So Salamakayo, and I just want to thank my team that's just done a beautiful job with this program. Thank you very much, uh, our <coughs> presenters, from uh, uh, equipment to uh, um, striving to uh, thrive to. Um, mental health. I mean, what more can you not uh, have heard this morning? I mean, this is all covering uh, different aspects um, of uh, Christian health care. For us who are Christians, uh, uh, the imperative is to, to do the best we can with, um, with, uh, with probably the least we have in our, in our resource-constrained uh, uh, environments. Um, uh, the challenge is, is to mobilize those resources, both human um, infrastructure um, and whatever else you have, finances, to, uh, to, pro to, to, to create a caring environment that is truly uh, Christian. And so I would uh, open the floor. We have, uh, we have about uh, maybe it's five, ten minutes, so if we can stretch it, uh, of questions uh, to our panelists. Uh, anybody who is um, who has got a, who is moving roving around with a microphone? Uh, I've, got, I've got a loud voice. Uh, oh, I okay. If somebody can help us, yeah, yeah. yes, please. Yeah. Thanks. Um, thank you. Those are really fantastic presentations and um, really exciting work that you're doing. And I have just a. I actually have a couple of questions. So, is that okay? Oh, I'm E.J. Ashbourne. I'm executive director for PQMD, which is the Partnership for Quality Medical Donations. And we're a partner of AmeriCares and, and sort of a budding partner of CCIH, so just to be <laughs> um, So I just have a couple questions. So just as I came in a bit late, um, 
So um, in terms of the medical equipment management program uh, for Haiti, I, I was really um, impressed with the kind of guidelines and kind of messages that you were giving. And I'm wondering to what extent, I may have missed this, to what extent it is used in other countries or you've, you've uh, developed a case study so it could be used in other countries. I'm gonna do three quick questions, okay? Um, for Anne, I just wanted to talk about um, the care, where care falls, as you mentioned, um, where care falls as a priority for health systems as it relates to access to health care. And then uh, in addition to that, you had talked about all the data that you're developing and the data that you're collecting. And to what extent does that feed up into the health system and is the government actually taking that on board and, and revising or um, investing? in whatever is necessary to keep that going. And then um, regarding the mental health uh, presentation, which I think I think we do a set of guidelines on uh, for drug donations and also for medical missions. And I have to tell you, we, are com we have completely missed the psychosocial component. So just wanted to say thank you. Um, and also to see what kind of thing you would recommend is kind of a basic uh, for disaster response? Like how would you put it into a set of guidelines or a set of responses so that you could accommodate it? Not just in the short term, because I think of it a little bit like a, um, a chronic disease. It's not something that you can actually just come in, do, and then leave. Um, sort of how can we include that in our disaster response materials and make sure that it has some kind of resilience down the line? So thanks. Okay, I will go to the mental, uh, excuse me, to the medical equipment question. Um, so the answer is yes, we do distribute um, medical equipment around the world. We have a partnership with um, a medical equipment company that we have access to extremely large volumes of equipment that's being pulled out of large hospital systems throughout the country, repaired and prepared by biomeds, and then we are we're very kind of strategic about where we put it, though. It's not just going to go just anywhere. We're very, very thorough in our thought process. Um, and, and the reason behind that is I've, I've lived and worked in Haiti for quite a while, and I know what happens when it's not done through that whole process. It ends up in what I call the equipment graveyard. It becomes a huge burden not only on the organization. It can actually be dangerous um, to the patients when the wrong things are sent. So we're very in, intent on that. The level of detail, though, of this particular program is being piloted for the first time in Haiti in this really systematic, um, totally comprehensive approach, bringing in partners from all these different areas. So that's something that's designed to be reproducible, but definitely in Haiti at that level of detail. And I think we want to be a partner in Haiti as well. Um, so to EJ's two questions, if I can remember them, the first on access to care, and um, that's actually what we began um, looking at and trying to measure first in equitable access and measuring are those who are poorest actually able to um, get into our services. For me, it's, it's one of the basic tenets. The difference between the MDGs and the SDGs is really some of those cross-cutting issues around equity and care and trust. And so we began not just in our Strive to Thrive program, but in all of our programs to figure out a way to measure who was coming in and um, whether we were capturing and getting equitable access. Liberia was a really interesting example because you would have thought in the rural area where we were working, we were reaching the poorest of the poor, but in fact, we were getting many of the poorest of the poor, but a lot of middle income as well. And so I think it's a very important touch point to, um, to, to begin to look at and to measure. I know that when USAID started looking at um, pro-poor policies and measuring um, coverage, they often found the rich are the best at accessing right. those free services. Yeah. Um, and it wasn't always going where they thought it was yeah. going to go. So you actually do have to, um, to measure that. And the other question was, I already uh, forgot. Oh, so I mean, this is right now it's fairly localized and what we are discovering is the, um, the places where we work with the local 
public health departments, they already have a data capture system and we're working at buy-in from the local providers. Again, in Liberia, a good example is working very closely with the community health teams and they look at it. Um, what I'm hoping is once we have sequential data, that it will be something that is valued and that they will, um, whether it's our tool or a different tool, I hope at the very least the things that we've added to sort of standard facility assessment, which are a lot of the care components, will become standard practice. Because if you think about the WHO building blocks, they don't really talk about care. They don't talk about care for the healthcare workers and they don't really talk about care. And with the global policy discussion around respectful care in especially in maternal child health there's a need for it i think there's a place for it within uh, health system strengthening lens i'll let joan talk about the mental health and i can do more yeah i'll, I'll start the mental health and um disaster piece and then at, and has a more global perspective and can add a bit more in the philippines one of the first teams they they line up when a disaster hits is the mental health team to go and do psychological first aid. They take art supplies for the kids and they're there <laughs> along with the medical teams to make sure that any, um, any crises are dealt with and also that some resilience is built in. And globally, mental health is one of our frontline interventions that gets deployed along with our medical teams. and often ends up leading to our longer term programming. Did you want to add to that? Uh, yeah, I will just say that when we respond to a disaster and we do about 30 to 35 big disasters a year, some of them very large, initially it's going in and doing the assessment. It's a lot about access to medicines. We distribute a lot less medical equipment. Um, and more and more we are bringing in the mental health component very early. So in the three hurricane season, Harvey, Irma, and Maria, a mainstay of our programs in Texas and Puerto Rico was around mental health psychosocial and primarily training in resiliency for healthcare workers. So We've um, worked with and built capacity for more than 5,000 health workers on the island of Puerto Rico so that they were ready and able. It's now being embedded into the program. We also believe very strongly, and the earlier session talked about research, that we need to be able to document that this is making a difference, both for the people who receive the training, the capacity building, but also for the recipients of the care from those now trained providers. And so um, we're in the process of doing that and beginning to um, get some publications out around the successes in the training. We began actually in Nepal, which Joan is um, overseas in a community health, mental health, psychosocial program, teaching village health workers, doing theater and drama in Nepal um, out in communities and reaching many thousands, again, of village health workers and hundreds of thousands of community um, workers after the, the big earthquake four and a half years ago. One, so. one, one more question here. Yeah. One, one more question, yes. That one's for you. My name's Milton Amai and I'm from the Philippines. Yeah. <laughs> in fact, I just visited the area that you described in your presentation, Joan. And I was wondering whether there was a faith-based connection uh, of your project because I was astounded by the number of pastors in that area of the Philippines. In fact, I was there on my birthday and they gave me a birthday party. <laughs> and I was wondering whether you, your project had a connection with these faith-based networks available there. You know, it, it's not formally built into the program, but the teams, I, I would say, our nurses who coordinate that program have strong faith themselves. And what they're doing now is trying to find each of the community groups and, um, and, and sectors that can help them engage with the community even more effectively. And so I'll check with them if they've been reaching out to some of the pastors and, and trying to use that, that faith context for, for expanding their work. At the moment, it hasn't been um, formalized in that way, but it's an awesome suggestion. They're always looking for ideas on how to really entrench into the community. 
We'll take one more question. Thank you for your patience. We'll, we'll just take one more question. Yeah, I'll try and keep this short. My name is Geraldine Hoover, and I'm a nurse, and I'm finishing up my MPH here at Hopkins. Um, I was curious, Anne, about you. You mentioned respectful care. You mentioned um, in the DR the folks wanting training for the providers to be respectful human beings, both to their patients and to each other as they interacted with them, well, within themselves. Um, when I was, in, I was in Cameroon last year and I got to talk to a midwife who had a line of 15 mothers sitting on a bench outside of her office, all waiting to see her. And she told me, I feel like I am not able to provide the kind of care I would like. And I know that, but I don't know what I can do about it and still try and meet all of the needs that I see available. So I was curious, like, I think there are so many well-meaning doctors and nurses who frankly don't feel like they have the organizational or institutional support or the time that they want to be able to provide that type of care because it does take time. So I was curious if, as you guys have done trainings or things like that, if you've done things like engaging with organizations or clinics around changing any policies to allow, you know, changing workflow a little bit or creating more time for visits or things like that. So quantity of healthcare workers in order to do the job is a major challenge in many places. And I know that when I get too busy, as Joan said, I get a little cranky, so we're not surprised. And an overwhelmed um, healthcare worker who knows they can and should do better, but can't because of the structures around them are less respectful and caring. Um, there are pieces that can be done to, you know, it's hard to get a, a government institution to be able to um, hire more people, but even within the limited amounts of time, you can be either more respectful or less respectful. You can recognize a patient who's coming in and talking about their stomach aches and their headaches and the, the provider knows that it's an emotional distress and, and they can either not care and say, hey, you're fine, go home, stop bothering me, or um, you know, be respectful of that. I had a rural healthcare worker in Afghanistan who with one hour of training around mental health psychosocial said, I didn't realize how much stress, post-traumatic stress or whatever from the war in Afghanistan, I myself was um, experiencing and therefore my own reaction to people was not good. So he became self-aware, that made a difference, but he also became aware that when people coming to him with certain things or ways of expressing it, that they were experiencing that. And he said it didn't take him any more time, but his attitude changed and his words changed and his compassion changed. And so while we certainly need to get and right size the number of patients per healthcare worker, um, and we should continue to work on that, in the meantime, we need to help both the health workers feel cared for and your example is really, you know, they're not being cared for if they're seeing that many patients, but also to empower them to do the best that they can so they at least feel better that they've treated people well within their circumstances. Very good. Well, thank you very much. That was a really a, a good conclusion to the, to the session. Thank you so much. We wish we could take more questions, but uh, I think our time is up. Uh, it's time for lunch. Thank you very much. Thank you for... <laughs>